Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Exodus 17, verse 3. But the people thirsted there for water, <laughs> and the people murmured <laughs> against Moses. You know, it's always interesting. It's always somebody else's fault. And said, why did you bring us out of Egypt? You just brought us out here to kill us. We're going to die of thirst. So in, verse, in chapter 16, they were going to die of hunger. Hunger In chapter 17, now they're dying of thirst. These guys have got serious problems. Numbers 21, 4 through 7. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient, depressed, and much discouraged because of the trials. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt so we could just die out here? <laughs> we don't have any bread. We don't have any water, and not only that, we are fed up with this miracle manna <laughs> that's coming out of the sky every day. Now, come on. I mean, come on. You know, that's why I just feel the urgency sometimes to tell people, more than you need a miracle, you need spiritual maturity. Because you see, if God gives you a miracle, and you still haven't grown up spiritually, then the next time you have a problem, you got to have another miracle. Then the next time you have a problem, you got to have another miracle. But if you're spiritually mature, then you can be the same no matter what your circumstances are. And that's God's goal in our lives. Not to just, just keep having to treat us like babies where the only way we can be happy is if we got our bottle and our pacifier and our blankie and all that stuff. Come on now, I'm preaching good, better than you're acting. I mean, God was sending their food out of the... Can you imagine how excited they were about that manna the first time they saw it? Oh, this is so cool. God, our God is an awesome God. If they would have known that song, then they would have been singing it. Our God is an awesome God he I mean they would have been doing it but after a little bit of manna we are sick of this manna see that proves that you get a miracle and it don't take long and if you got a grouchy heart the grouchy heart's going to come right back out and grouch even about the miracle that you got but you see we pray for something and then we complain about it they had manna now they're complaining about it. But now watch verse 7 or verse 6. Then the Lord, don't forget verses 4 and 5, they got impatient, they got discouraged because of their trials. Verse 5, they spoke against God, against Moses. We have no water, we have no bread, we're sick of the manna. Verse 6, then the Lord sent fiery burning serpents among the people. <laughs> and they bit them. And they died. <laughs> Progression. Murmur, grumble, complain. Don't appreciate the miracles of God. Grumble, find fault. The door is open for serpents. They bite you, <laughs> you die. <laughs> And I love this. This, this, just, this is just like a comedy to me. Verse 7, and the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. <laughs> 23,000 people had to die before they got it. And they all dropped dead in one day. It's like, wow, something's going on here, folks. People are dying right and left. You think maybe we've done something wrong? Now, you know, it's comical, but the thing that, you, that we have to understand is 
This was because of complaining. Something that we don't even see is a sin. I would venture to say that 99% of people, Christians who complain, don't ever repent for doing it. They don't even think it's a problem. Oh, well, you know, I'm just a human being. <laughs> well, yeah, duh, but you're a born-again human being, full of God, full of the fruit of the Spirit. Murmur, grumble, find fault, and complain. Can any of you think of something right this minute that you've been complaining about? Come on, let's don't fly the flag at half-mast. Okay, well, I'm not, I'm not even going to tell you stop it. I'm going to tell you start praying about it. Start praying about it. <clears throat> Philippians 2.14. Do all things without grumbling, fault finding, and complaining against God, and questioning and doubting among yourselves. And then verse 15 goes on to say that you may show yourself to be a bright light in a dark world. That you may show yourself to be children of God. So one of the things that God is looking for is a difference in us in the world to where, where they're complaining, grumbling, murmuring, and finding fault with everything. We're not doing that. We're not to gossip, judge, or criticize. Now, let me just say a word about this whole realm of judging things before I get into this. Actually, Paul did tell us to judge sin. And he even went so far as to say, if the person won't repent and be restored and they continue in that behavior, then you should not fellowship with them. So when I say don't judge, we don't all just no longer see sin or we're going to just gloss over things and let all kinds of junk be in the church and we don't want to deal with it because we don't want to judge. We don't want to judge. That's taking it to the other extreme. Actually, Paul said we're not called to, those, to judge those outside the church, but we, all call, we are called to judge those inside the church. However, he's not talking about judging somebody's heart. He's talking about the sin. <laughs> and I believe that we can hate the sin and love the sinner. And I do believe that we have a problem when somebody does something, we not only judge the sin, we judge them, and then very often from then on we have an attitude about them. And our religious attitude won't even let them recover. The Bible says that you're to bear with the failings of the weak, you're to pray for those that are doing things that are wrong. We want to remember what Jesus prayed on the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. What they did was wrong, but he knew that they were deceived. I wonder how many people that we judge harshly and critically are just deceived. And you know, when you're deceived, you're believing a lie. I know there were a lot of people that judged me critically and judged my behavior and I didn't know what was wrong with me. I'd been abused by my dad and I had all these problems in my soul and man, I was getting up every day and doing the best I could. But truth was, I was obnoxious. I didn't know it. And I didn't need somebody's criticism, I needed prayer. And more than anything, I needed a good example in front of me to show me what I was supposed to be like because I'd never had a good example. And that was what God gave me in Dave was a solid, stable, good example. And he just kept being what he was, which was a man of God, until I got it. And that's what we need to be. We need to be solid, stable, good examples for people to look at so they want what we want. Instead of just, well, what's the matter with you? What did you need? You need to change. You need it. Judge the sin, but be careful that you don't turn against the sinner. Now, we do need to be careful who we hang out with. But, you know, there's a difference in having close fellowship with somebody and being downright rude to them. Amen? you got to be led by God. You just can't go in like a bull in a china cabinet and 
let me give you my gospel tracts and three Joyce Meyer books and a new rendition of the Bible and I'm going to straighten you out. So it's not that we don't judge sin, but you still have to be careful how you treat the sinner. Now, Matthew 7. I think, that, I think this is a really, really, really important area for Christians because I do think that we get our religious snooty noses up in the air. And boy, somebody does something wrong and they're like, out. We better remember, but for the grace of God, there go I. Okay, now I don't know, if you weren't here last night, I just got to reiterate that when I first started restudying for myself this whole spectrum of the words again, which I've been on this journey for a while now, it was actually through seeking God about wanting to see greater and more powerful answers to prayer. Are you with me? How many of you want to get your prayers answered? All right. And it led me to a scripture in Isaiah, which I read last night, where he basically said, you'll call and I'll say, here I am, if you take away from you the finger pointed in scorn toward the oppressed or the godly, and you get rid of every form of false, harsh, unjust, wicked speaking. So we see right there that God is saying, hey, I will answer your prayers speedily if you stop judging people and you start getting really careful about what's coming out of your mouth the rest of the time when you're not praying. Now, here's another scripture that pretty much says the same thing, only a little different way. Matthew 7, 1, don't judge and criticize and condemn others so that you may not be judged and criticized and condemned yourselves. Everybody say, I reap what I sow. I wonder if we really believe that. You know what? We really don't believe that. We really don't. We say we do, but we don't because if we really believed it, we wouldn't do some of the stuff we do. For just as you judge and criticize and condemn others, you will be judged and criticized and condemned. And in accordance with the measure you use to deal out to others, it will be dealt out to you again. Why do you stare from without at the very small particle that's in your brother's eye, but don't become aware of and consider the beam of timber in your own eye? I think it's the message of the Living Bible. One of them says, why are you trying to take the toothpick out of your brother's eye when you have a telephone pole in your own eye? And, you know, that's really the truth because it's like when we have so many problems of our own and we're ignoring them and we're wearing this religious cloak, it makes us just look at everybody else through a magnifying glass and here we are trying to fix them and we have no ability to fix them because we're such a mess ourselves. How can you say to your brother, verse 4, let me get the tiny particle out of your eye when there's a beam of timber in your own eye? You hypocrite. First get the beam of timber out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the tiny particle out of your brother's eye. You see, once we let God deal with us, and there's a, a, a deep degree of humility that comes into our lives because we've seen our own sin, now we can help restore our brothers and sisters with a spirit of gentleness and a spirit of love that will actually bring restoration in their life rather than condemnation. How many of you know when you're dealing with somebody that's, that's got a weakness in an area, if you have also had that same weakness and by God's grace and mercy you've overcome it, how many of you know that you are much more gentle in how you deal with them than if, well, I, you know, I just can't believe you did that. It's amazing how if we've never had a problem, we just don't get it. Do not give that which is holy, the sacred thing, to the dogs. And don't throw your pearls before hogs, lest they trample on them with their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. Now, what in the world does that mean? It's like, whoa, where did that go? I believe I have understanding of what that means. I believe that we have a holy thing in us. We have the love of God in us. And he says, don't throw that holy thing in front of the devil and let him just trample all over it. You have the ability to love people, so don't be critical and judgmental and and fault finding when you could be merciful and help bring restoration. I'll give you an example. Years ago when I was still teaching a small home Bible study, I had three children at the time and I'd always felt really good when I was pregnant. I'd be a little tired the first six weeks and other than that, you wouldn't even hardly know I was pregnant. 
I did all my work, you know, didn't get sick to my stomach, none of that. And uh, so while I was teaching my Bible study, the leader of the Bible study, there was a young girl that came all the time that, that got pregnant. She already had a couple kids and she got pregnant again. And, and uh, so she started missing Bible study all the time because she didn't feel good. Didn't, she didn't feel, didn't, didn't feel good. Nauseated, tired, didn't feel good. Well, I remember me and two or three others of the sisters. <laughs> there were no brothers, just the sisters. And we were discussing what a, what a shame it was that she didn't discipline herself. And how, how ridiculous it was because she needed this word that I was teaching. You understand? She needed my spiritual input in her life. And here she wouldn't, was just, you just need to suck it up and just do it. Well, we just went on, never thought anything about it. Now, mind you, none of us offered to help her. <laughs> none of us offered to go clean her house that day so she could come. We didn't even bother to pray for her. We just had our opinions. So I got pregnant for the fourth time with my child that is now 29. And I was a woman of faith. And I believed God for that pregnancy to be perfect. Now, I didn't even pray over the other three because I didn't know to, but now I'm a woman of faith and power. And I was so sick. <laughs> I want to tell you, I was tired. I was nauseated. I mean, from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet, I felt horrible, sick, sick, horrible, no energy at all. Couldn't hardly drag myself off the couch. Well, I just don't understand what's wrong. I've been praying. I'm rebuking devils. I'm believing God. And I just stayed sick. And one day I could hear my family out in the yard. They was out in the backyard with the kids and they were playing ball or something. And I'm like, I just wish I could go outside with my family. And I don't know why I have to be so sick. So I said to God, this is such a valuable thing. I said to God, okay, what's wrong here? I want to challenge you when things aren't going right. To say that, but be open to God touching something in your heart first. The minute that I said that to God, it was like I had a vision and I saw that woman that had been in my Bible study years before. <laughs> and I saw me and the sisters. <laughs> and I knew the next thing that I thought of was Matthew 7. I got Matthew 7 out and I read it. And I knew that I knew that I knew that I was reaping what I had sown. And I'm so grateful for that experience because nothing impacts you like having a personal experience where you know that God has got your number. <laughs> Amen? And what I'm going to tell you is the absolute truth. I prayed and asked God to forgive me, and I immediately started feeling better and felt good the rest of that pregnancy. I had opened a door through judgment. But now, here's what I want you to see. And I've been reading Matthew 7, but for some reason, I think I thought when he took off on prayer in verse 7, we were now going to a new subject. But now I know better. Now I know that he's saying, and so, let's just put it like this. If you won't judge and criticize and condemn, if you won't point the finger at people and say ugly things about them, if you'll love people, now you can keep on asking and it will be given you. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking reverently and the door will be opened. For everyone who keeps on asking receives. And he who keeps on seeking finds. And he who keeps on knocking to him the door will be opened. I believe he's very clearly saying there, if you want your prayers to get answered, then stop judging and criticizing and pointing the finger at other people. How many of you can see that? I mean, it's just as plain as it can be. 
He wasn't talking about one subject and then suddenly he went to some other totally unrelated subject. Why all of a sudden after that start talking about how to get your prayers answered? I don't know about you, but I don't want to waste my time. I'm not a person who likes to waste time. So if I'm going to pray, I want results. If I'm going to take my time and my effort and my energy and I'm going to pray, I want results. And if I'm not getting results, then I am going to be bold enough to ask God, what is wrong that I am not getting results? And I know there's patience and I know there's waiting and I know there's the enemy who comes against us. I know all that. But sooner or later, you got to see the whatever that God promises you. And you can do whatever you want to with this, but I've decided to grow up just a little bit more. And hopefully a little more after that and a little more after that. God changes us from glory to glory, little by little. We're on a journey. We haven't arrived. But I'll tell you one thing we have to do is press. And you have never had an area where you're going to have to press like you're going to have to press with this one concerning the mouth. And I don't think there's any hope for us if we don't put some scriptures up around the house, keep some books in front of us. You need to get my book, Me and My Big Mouth, and you need to read a few pages of it every day, possibly the rest of your life. But we have to keep things in front of us. Otherwise, we forget them. I really believe that this is not just a message from me. I mean, I, I'm going to tell you, I really don't. And I mean, I preach a lot. I mean, I preach a lot, you know. Sometimes 12, 20 times a month. I mean, I preach a lot. And I don't say anything that I don't think is God leading me, but there are things that I feel stronger about. I mean, even Dave said last night, when I went down the little steps, he's always there to wait for me, and he said, Man, you're fiery tonight. <laughs> and that's the way I feel about this. It's like I've got a real fire on the inside of me about this. That's why I don't want you to take this as just another little sermon on the mouth. You know, when people say, oh, I couldn't go to the conference. What'd she teach on? Don't you just say, oh, the mouth. You say, a life-changing <laughs> message on the power of our words. <laughs> One girl that works for me told me last night, and I thought this was very funny. She said, well, I just remembered that over the past few years, I have been given five copies of your book, Me and My Big Mouth. <laughs> when that book first came out, we had people calling the office, ordering them for other people anonymously. And then we would send them, and the people who got them would call us mad, wanting to know who sent it to them. <laughs> so we finally had to say, sorry, if you want to send a gift, it's going to have your name on it. We're not getting blamed for it. <laughs> Father, I pray in Jesus' name, help us. God, we cannot do this without your help. We've got to have your help. Lord, pour your spirit out upon us. Help us not to grieve the Holy Ghost with evil communication. Forgive us for our sins, Lord, and help us come up higher. I pray that everybody would be safe as they go this afternoon. They'd have a wonderful, relaxing, fun-filled afternoon and return safely tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. We love you. We well, you know the words that we speak have tremendous power to impact our lives as well as those around us. Proverbs 12, 18 says that speaking rashly is like the piercing of a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing.